Hi, folks. Chris Foss here from the Chris Foss Show.com. The Chris Foss Show.com. Hey, we're coming here with another great podcast. We did it again. Oops, like the 800th time or something. Who knew? Uh, <laughs> no one saw that coming. Anyway, guys, we certainly appreciate you tuning in today and spending some quiet time with us where we sit down by the fire and we have one of those little FDR moments. And I'm going to pet the dog and sit in my little uh, chair here and tell you about a uh, really cool podcast and author that we have on the show today and everything else. I was kind of settling in with that. I was kind of thinking I need like a little, you know, one of those lap uh, rugs or whatever, you know, they used to have. I think the FDR used to put over his legs. Anyway, uh, so guys, pull up to the fire. It's September, so, you know, it's probably fire uh, lighting season. If not, uh, you could be in California and it's fire lighting season there. I'm not sure why that's not funny. Uh, but anyway, guys, uh, be sure to subscribe to the show. Go to youtube.com for Chess Chris Foss. Hit the bell notification button. It's a little one that's shaped like a bell and a notification button. Just punch it and uh, good things will happen to you for the rest of your life or something like that. I don't know. The lawyer said I can't say that anymore. Anyway, guys, go to goodreads.com for Chess Chris Foss. Uh, follow us over there and everything we're reading and reviewing. See all the groups. There's a whole mess of groups. I can't even keep track of Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. All the crazy kids are over there playing, so we go play with them too, or play. We go play it on the on the sites. That is, geez, my parole agent says I can't say that anymore either. Anyway, guys, thanks for tuning in. We certainly appreciate you being here. Uh, we've got a wonderful author on the uh, show today. He's written a couple books, at least. His name is Dirk Smiley, and he's got a book that's coming out October fifth, twenty twenty one. The business of tomorrow: the visionary life of Harry. Guten, uh, Guggenheim, I think I got that right, Harry mm -hmm. Guggenheim, from aviation and rocketry to the creation of an art dynasty. We're going to be talking to him about his book today and everything that is in it. It's going to be a pretty interesting read. You're going to learn a lot of stuff. And uh, if I can pull up his bio between fighting with my uh, with my dealio here, we're going to talk about his, his background here. He was uh, the chief content officer at Guggenheim Partners, which he left to write his biography of Harry Guggenheim. Uh, prior to that, he was the senior writer at Forbes magazine covering stories from Paris. Uh, this is all going to go on the cutting room floor, isn't it? From Paris, Lyon, in the Bahamas and Mexico City, uh, he worked and covered media for Christian Science Monitor and has been a contributor to Newsweek International, the New York Times Upfront, and The Nation. He was a researcher at a media think tank at Columbia University and director of the News Research Group in New York. He is the former chair of the news category for the Webby Awards and Coro Fellow in Public Policy. He lives in Manhattan and has a daughter who started college this year. God bless him. He's going to need all the help he can get. The Business of Tomorrow is his second business biography. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm great, Chris. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Sorry, I have a giant camera that's in front of me, and I'm like dodging around multiple things here. But uh, we'll cut some of that uh, intro and in, in edit. But uh, give that's us good. your plugs so people can find you on the interwebs. Yeah, I'm on uh, Twitter at Absolute Smiley S M I L E Y, like the vodka, but not affiliated with the vodka. And uh, I am at the uh, Pegasus Books site as well. You can get a little more information about the book if you are so interested. That's Pegasus Books on the web. There you go. You had me at vodka. So there you go. Uh, so what motivated you to write this book? Well, Chris, I was a writer at Forbes for about a decade, as you mentioned. And uh, I then made a move to Wall Street. Um, and uh, that was based on a uh, friend of mine who actually she became a friend, but she was profiled in a story that I did at Forbes about the future of online education. And she moved over to Guggenheim Partners and called me one day about a job there, uh, which I took. And um, working at Guggenheim Partners, you know, I'd get phone calls from people who were like fund managers, a fund manager in Switzerland who would call up and say, you know, we have a we have a Swiss pension fund who's interested in possibly being a client. Uh, what have you got on the Guggenheim family history in Switzerland? Because the Guggenheims are from Switzerland originally. Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, I get another question about the mining business that the Guggenheims used to be in 
or philanthropy, aviation, rocketry, all these different subjects. And, you know, the answer I have, I'd have each time was nothing. I got nothing. So I started writing up these kind of mini business biographies when I was at Guggenheim. And the name who kept came, coming up over and over again was Harry Guggenheim. He was engineering a lot of these ventures and enterprises in kind of the early to mid 20th century. So at one point, I said to the co-founder of Guggenheim, uh, Guggenheim Partners, you know, um, Harry Guggenheim, you know, he's in, been involved with so much in family history. Um, someone should do a book on him. And there was someone who was working on a project, a book length project at the Harry Guggenheim Foundation at the time. So some time went on, basically make a long story short, I took the project uh, on myself, left Guggenheim Partners to work on it. And that's uh, that was kind of the origins of the book. That's awesome. So yeah. who are the Guggenheims? And uh, tell us, you know, what the Guggenheim Partners did. That, that might be a good foundation for people that aren't too familiar with them. Well, the Guggenheims at one point operated the largest mining conglomerate on the planet. Wow. Uh, they were into copper, lead, silver, um, you know, every metal on earth. That's really where, where they made their fortune. Mm. And then uh, around the turn of the century and leading up to the Depression, um, two of the founding seven brothers left the firm. So there were five brothers left. And the firm was being head, uh, headed at the time by Daniel Guggenheim, who was Harry's father. And so when Daniel died in 1930, Harry was sort of the likely person to take over Guggenheim brothers. Um, he, Harry had two siblings. He had a daughter named Gladys, uh, who, you know, in, in that age, women were really not considered uh, to as material to take over a family business, which is unfortunate. But uh, so she was sort of out of the running from the beginning. And then there was uh, Harry's older brother, Bert, who uh, at one point said to the family, you know, every family needs to have a man of leisure and I'm I'm going to appoint myself in that role. <laughs> so he he just kind of took himself out of the race. So it was it was left to Harry to, to kind of take over uh, the Guggenheim legacy, which he did uh, in the early 30s and uh, and then, you know, got involved in all these businesses as time went on. Um, Guggenheim Partners came much later, but I have some material on Guggenheim Partners because even though the firm was started many years after Harry died, the firm kind of grew out of the brand that he created, the oh. Guggenheim brand. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a, a legacy of his in some respects. And Guggenheim Partners um, is a uh, financial services firm. It's got an asset management side. It's got a securities business. And uh, they're, they're a, a privately held kind of boutique Wall Street firm that's mm -hmm. done very well over the last decade or so. There you go. Wall Street's yeah. been good. Um, is there a reason we haven't heard more of them? I mean, they're not like a household name, like, uh, you know, some of the robber barons of the 20s and stuff. Uh, is, is there a reason we haven't heard more about them or are they more of a common name? Well, they were they were known uh, in the mining industry um, uh, up until about the 1920s and the 30s. And then when Harry and his father kind of... Um, began to put a lot of money into aviation and then rocketry mm -hmm. the, the the brand kind of changed and the guggenheims became known as um you know these huge philanthropists in aviation and 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 then in you know during the rocket age so um they became i wouldn't say household names but you know harry was known as sort of the godfather of aviation oh wow you know, popular science kind mm -hmm. of gave him that title and, uh, you know, as time went on, there were a lot of businesses that the Guggenheims were involved in, but they, they weren't really, um, you know, they were, they were publicity shy, mm. generally speaking, unless there was a reason to um, have their name involved in something advancing uh, an enterprise where, you know, publicity would help in some mm. ways. Uh, so um, I think when the museum came along, that kind of redefined the, the family brand and the family became known for the museum mm -hmm. probably more than anything else. So this book is a kind of an attempt to go back and to, um, and to kind of like highlight all these different businesses the Guggenheims had been involved with over mm -hmm. the years and why their, you know, why their role was so important in these various business sectors. 
And you, you call uh, Harry the original uh, space investor. You know, we've got Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson and and anybody else who wants to 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 fly into space. Um, I know a few people I want to fly into space right now. Uh, but that would, uh, that would be a one way trip. A yeah, one way trip. Yeah. yeah. It's, there's no return. Uh, no deposit. <laughs> no return. Uh, but so why do you call him the original space investor? Let's get into some of that. That's an interesting question. You know, he. Um, kind of placed his bets on two different strategies at the very beginning of the space race. Um, he bankrolled Robert Goddard, who today is kind of known as the father of American rocketry. Um, Goddard was a uh, physics professor at Clark University uh, who was basically shooting off rockets at his aunt's cabbage farm in Massachusetts. And um, the stories about him initially were, you know, he, he he was basically covered as this like nutty professor who was trying to get to the moon, which is not really true. All he was trying to do was essentially, um, you know, uh, work on propulsion systems. And um, he, he, you know, the idea of space travel was certainly something that he wrote about and thought about, but it wasn't really the focus of his, of his rocket experiments. So in any case, Charles Lindbergh and Harry um, learned about Goddard and, um, decided to uh, back his experiments. Oh, wow. um, and Goddard initially had funding from the Smithsonian, Carnegie Institution, uh, and a few others early on. But those were those, that was kind of like short-term funding, and it didn't last. Harry's funding lasted year after year after year. I think he uh, funded Goddard's experiments for over a decade. Wow. So, um, so that was one bet that Harry placed on the rocket age. The other was um, he put a lot of money into programs at the um, uh, California Institute of Technology, Caltech out in Pasadena, California, wow. mm -hmm. and they had their own programs going, but Harry basically uh, underwrote um, Theodore von Karman, uh, this um, sort of aviation genius who was in Germany at the time. Harry, uh, uh, paid for von Karman to come over and start a rocket research in the United States at Caltech. And um, one of the programs that spun out from that Caltech program was the Jet Propulsion Lab, which has oh. been responsible for, you know, the Mars landers and uh, and so many other things during, during you know, this period of research in space. So so Harry kind of had a two-track approach with the, the individual with Robert Goddard and then the institution with Caltech. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, back then there really wasn't anybody spending a lot of money on space. Uh, mm -hmm. Even the military uh, really didn't see the value of investing in research in, in rockets mm -hmm. until well after World War II. And, you know, after World War II, there was this long period of time when the United States really wasn't doing much in the way of rocket research at all. Mm -hmm. And then Sputnik came along. Russians launched the first satellite into orbit. And, you know, then all hell broke loose in the United States and the military and science, scientific establishment saying, what have we been doing? What's happening? You know, how could the Russians be so far ahead of us? So that's when the, uh, the U S aerospace program really ramped up. But a lot of the research that was deployed around that time was based on Robert Goddard's liquid fuel, uh, propulsion systems, mm. you know, uh, it, it, like, the liquid fuel rockets and the multi-stage rockets, which ultimately put men on the moon. I mean, those were ideas that Goddard developed, um, you know, several decades earlier. Mm -hmm. And you you say in the book that he had a uh, Harry had a, a greater impact on the development of aviation than the Wright brothers. That's pretty. That's pretty tall order, right? That's a pretty tall order. Um, and I I was skeptical when I first read that claim, but that claim was made by a guy who was the former dean of the Harvard Business School who got together with a couple of other researchers and did a study of leadership during the air age. Mm. And they essentially, you know, asserted that uh, with all of the all of the money that Harry Guggenheim and I put into aviation really amounted to a greater contribution to the advancement of aviation than the Wright brothers themselves. And that's because when after the Wright brothers essentially invented the airplane. They did everything in their power to protect their patents and their designs. So mm -hmm. they wound up in court um, one year after the next, uh, trying to 
stop people from um you know using their designs and employing them in their aircraft uh production oh, wow. models so the wright brothers um i mean you can't blame them for wanting to protect sure. their invention but you know on the other hand it uh, it slowed down the development of aviation until people like harry guggenheim and others came along and and uh, did a lot of things to try to basically lift the um the field off the ground oh. and kind of jump start it as it were did he ever have any uh, do anything with Howard Hughes? I know Howard Hughes during that time did a lot with the aviation. You know, I know that he was uh, aware of Howard Hughes and what he was doing, but I think that, you know, Harry kind of had his own yeah. money and Howard Hughes, um, you know, was a guy that was so eccentric and so kind of unusual in his taste about aviation. I, I don't know that Harry considered Howard Hughes to be um, a serious factor in what he was trying to do, which is to basically yeah. kind of lay the foundations for aviation to, to become commercially viable. So uh, as far as I know, he didn't have any contacts uh, with yeah. Howard Hughes, but uh, Hughes was certainly another kind of eccentric, wildly rich person who was interested in aviation. And there were quite a lot of people like that at the time. Sounds like Harry was more into rockets and and I know Howard Hughes was more into you know, TWA and building all of all of uh, you know just normal airline stuff, and then of course the spruce yeah. goose. That was an interesting thing. That's um, still down in uh, Long Beach, right? I believe it's moved oh. up to. Uh, uh, I think it's in Oregon or Washington now. They moved it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. this is wow. a interesting thing. I mean, that's a, a lot of money just to just to park in a while. But yeah, for long there time, it was there by the Queen Mary. Um, yeah. And uh, you mentioned the book, he was a confidant to six presidents. So he saw some interesting stuff and in financial force behind commercial aviation, space exploration. You know, this guy was into yeah. everything. Yeah, it was. He really was. He was, uh, I mean, aviation was his his real love. He had been a pilot during World War I and um, he was a pretty good pilot. But he had he had an analytical mind and he, he understood... Um, a great deal about the kind of the engineering of planes and mm -hmm. what kind of technology would be required to kind of take them to the next level in terms of speed and, ele and distance, elevation, etc. And so um, I think he felt that he was knowledgeable enough about um, the, the technology and the business, such as it was, mm -hmm. that he knew where the 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 kind of pressure points were. He knew he knew where to put the spark plugs the financial spark plugs to try to help lift aviation um, off the ground and into um, a level of production that it could actually be commercially viable. And, you know, some of that was psychological because a lot of people, particularly in, in the 1920s, most people have never actually seen an airplane in person. They, they might have seen drawings or illustrations or, you know, photos of airplanes in the newspaper. But uh, Harry bankrolled Lindbergh's um, national tour after Lindbergh did his, his famous flight to New York to Paris. Uh, and that was an opportunity for people to come and see an airplane actually land and take off on time. That must be and, wild uh, to see for the you first know, time. it was like hundreds of thousands of people came to, you know, see Lindbergh whenever he landed in their city. Lindbergh, I think, went to 82 cities across 48 states. And it also generated a huge amount of press coverage. But I think what what Harry's idea behind that was to try to you know change the narrative of air travel to try to demonstrate that well you know airplanes are actually pretty reliable they can land and take off on time safely and uh so there was a there was a, a kind of a psychological hurdle that he knew had to be made before there would be more general acceptance of air travel you know regardless of you know how many planes are being produced in the US yeah. I mean, I think about that uh, every now and then when I'm on a plane and I take off and I think, you know, like about a hundred years ago, this was like not possible. Like we just do this, like eh, it's a plane taking off, eh, whatever, you know, it's, amazing. it's just routine and you yeah. just think about it. And I mean, you know, my favorite moment is that moment when you, when it, when it, you know, the wing, the, the wind or whatever catches the velocity, the wind catches the, the wings and it and it takes flight and that that moment that you leave the ground is just the most special moment for me um yeah which, and it's not the special moment when i'm uh, being felt up in tsa so there's that uh <laughs> yeah uh, 
You also talk. You about need the uh, TSA pre-check. Yeah, I, well, I, you know, I just, I hate the whole experience of being jammed into a, a tube with a bunch of people in Sardineville. I, they, yeah. they make those, they, they, they just make everything smaller and smaller. I used to have fun back in the days before the computers got really good at making, at overbooking the flights. You know, there, mm. there, there used to be a time where sometimes you just catch a flight and you're just like, I'll sit anywhere on this thing. And, uh, you know, you could always maybe bet that, you know, you might have a, couple rows or a couple seats next year would be empty now it's just like they got people piled on top of each other but you know yeah we can't blame harry for that he had rockets so um <laughs> this is true you tell the story yeah. behind the uh, oh that was the other question i had a thing i had for you you know i grew up uh uh loving the i can't remember this the guy's name now but the x1 rocket you remember that where it broke the speed of sound and then they broke yeah. the speed of whatever and mock and all mm -hmm. that sort of stuff i grew up reading those stories and was just so enamored by him mm -hmm. and i guess we can credit him for that huh yeah uh well robert goddard um with his uh you know various rocket experiments uh at one point developed a rocket that could be put underneath the wings of airplanes mm -hmm. and the military uh worked with goddard on that and also uh, caltech uh, because they were interested in in rockets that could basically um, uh, add to the payload of uh, fighter jets and also um, have their have their taxiing distance be shorter. And those things were amazing. They just basically um, you know lifted the plane up immediately at the moment that it really needed that lift, and that uh, led to um, those supersonic. Planes yeah. you were talking about, the X1 and the X2, Chuck Yeager breaking Chuck the sound. Chuck Yeager, that's yeah. it. He's the yeah. first man to break the sound barrier, which yeah. is amazing. And uh, yeah, all of those kind of successive experiments with uh, rockets on planes that eventually turned into the jet age um, were uh, largely due to Robert Goddard's work huh. on uh, liquid liquid fuel engines. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Brought us here. Um, your book talks about the story behind the uh, uh, Guggenheim uh, Museum and uh, its creation. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, Chris, I was really interested in that part of Harry's story because I think most people um, who know the Guggenheim Museum, they, they, they may know its full title, the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum, and would assume that Solomon was the guy who built it. Solomon, Solomon was one of the Guggenheim, one of the original Guggenheim brothers. Um, and it was, in fact, Solomon's idea to create the museum. And Solomon and his art director at the time, Hilla Ribe, had retained Frank Lloyd Wright, the architect, uh, to design the museum. But uh, the truth is, is that Solomon died 10 years before the museum even opened. Wow, And uh, so it was left to Harry, who was on the board at the time. Solomon had put Harry on the board because he, you know, he admired Harry and thought he'd be uh, an asset to the building of the museum. But he didn't put him in charge. The guy who was in charge was Solomon's daughter's um, husband. But he and his um, and his wife lived in England at the time. And there was some controversy that was developing about the creation of the museum and so the trustees uh, decided to put Harry in charge of it mm. uh, because they wanted someone in New York and also someone, I think, with Harry's skills mm. to be able to kind of guide it to to completion. So um, Harry actually was the was the kind of driving force behind the museum being built in the first place. And um, he also um, I think he did something that was important, which was. Um, he renamed the museum. The museum originally was going to be known as the Museum of Non-Objective Art, mm. which is a strange title. You know, it's strange to have a title of something that tells you it's something that it's not, you know, the non-objective art, <laughs> Wh whatever that even means. Most people don't really understand wh what that would mean in the first place. So, yeah. so Harry just kind of, he, uh, he changed the title to the Solomon Guggenheim uh, museum, and he knew that um, it would just be referred to as the Guggenheim. And that was important because it kind of branded the family's values with the with with the museum itself. And it and um, that brand became a kind of a global art brand 
and spinoff museums were created from the Guggenheim brand, as you know. I mean, the mm-hmm. um, the uh, Guggenheim Bilbao in Spain has been a pretty big success. The Abu the Abu Dhabi Museum um, is underway. It's sort of it's taking a long time to get that built, but uh, I think that's going to be finished around uh, 2026, I believe. There you go. And, um, you know, then you have a lot of other museums that have been built around the world where um, the architect is kind of the star, you know, Mm. and and so it's kind of turned museums into works of art themselves to some degree. Mm. Uh, So, um, you know, I credit Harry with a lot of that uh, trend because uh, that's exactly what he did with the with the Guggenheim Museum. But the the interesting part of the story for me was early on when um you know the museum was just based on solomon guggenheim's art collection and he wanted to have a repository for it and uh he his art director at the time hilla ribe was this kind of very eccentric uh german i call her kind of a minor aristocrat um she knew a lot of artists back in europe and she introduced solomon to this whole world of non-objective art but um she set up the museum in a way like uh, almost as if it was going to be a kind of a spiritual experience. Like the 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 forerunner to the Guggenheim Museum was was in a uh, former auto showroom and Hilla Ribe would light incense and then she'd play Bach in the background. And then you'd have these like auto, Ottoman couches in the middle of the room where people would sit down and look at the paintings, which had been mounted way low on the walls, like just above the baseboard with these thick wooden frames. Mm. And so it was a sort of a wacky experience. And the Guggenheims were getting a lot of criticism for the fact that all of these uh, favorite artists by Hilla Ribe were being displayed. Meanwhile, like Chagall or Picasso would be collecting dust, you know, back in the, <laughs> in the storeroom. Well, those guys and, were hacks uh, anyway. Really. Yeah, who cares about them, right? <laughs> so, um, so you know, Hilla Ribe had all these kind of eccentric business practices, and um, the the criticism of her management of the museum was mounting, particularly in the New York Times mm. at the time, because uh, you know the museum was a nonprofit organization, so it had some obligation to the public interest. And the Times actually at one point wrote an editorial suggesting that the Guggenheims should just give up the museum and its collection to one of the established museums like the Met or MoMA, because, you know, these people know how to curate, they know how Mm -hmm. to manage a museum and Mm -hmm. just get it out of the hands of this wacky Hillary Bay. And I think when that story came out, you know, Harry hit the ceiling. I mean, it was, you know, you can imagine what the feeling was like to be criticized in the New York Times, to be told that the Guggenheim family is, is too incompetent to manage its own museum, much less its own museum, you know, archives and its collections. So, um, so at that point, Harry brought in, he had a meeting with the New York Times reporter and some others, and basically he made a series of reforms. And one of those was changing the name of the museum and then also um, kind of expanding the mission of the museum. So it's not just looking at the non-objective work, but it's looking at all these other kind of mm-hmm. modernist painters and sculptors and um that went over very well it was those those fixes were very effective and i think that um you know it led a lot uh to it contributed a lot to the museum um opening with a lot of acclaim um certainly a lot of controversy at the time but also you know in the long run i think it was uh it's been considered a, a success probably better than the the chick's idea of the wacky tobacco let's get high and look at uh, pictures sort of <laughs> <laughs> concept. <laughs> I don't know there. that there was any mind altering drugs involved, but I uh, can't say there wasn't. I mean, you know, hey, let's, but uh, the uh, what, what's that type of art you're saying again? The non the oh, non, uh, uh, non objective art is that abstract art? Is that what that is? Uh, I don't even know what that is. Yeah, it's considered to be a kind of like a subset of abstract art because abstract art can have real symbols and images in it i mean like an abstract painting could have a tree uh or a you know a person in it even but um the non-objective art is like pure 
like lines and figures and shapes that you don't see in nature. Mm. And, um, you know, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's interesting work, but it's a, um, you know, it's a genre. It's like, a, mm. uh, it's, it's a, it's, um, it's, it's a sort of a subset of the larger umbrella of abstract art and to have a museum that just focused on non-objective art, you know, it's fine, but, um, the collection, I mean, Solomon's collection had over a thousand pieces of work in it. Wow. And so, uh, people were upset that, uh, all these other pieces were not getting showcased. And, you know, also Hilla Rebe mm. was showing a lot of her own work. She was an artist. Uh. And at one point she put on her own kind of one woman show at the Guggenheim and the entire, I mean, the entire museum was filled with Hilla Rebe's work. Oh, wow. Which, uh, you know, she's like, I'm so, promoting my own stuff here. That Monet guy's yeah. a hack. Uh, you know, I mean, any, I, Monet might look good if you use a little wacky tobacco. I don't know there. Um, all that good stuff. Really? So what else have we touched on in the book you like to tease out to readers? Uh, well, I think that the aviation rocketry and the museum, those are kind of like the lasting institutions that, um, Harry helped to create. Uh, there were two others that he was involved in, uh, which were, which were, great successes. One was a uh, thoroughbred horse farm that started out with basically one horse and uh, Harry built it into um, what was in 1959, the largest, um, or I should say the highest earning stables in the U S which is pretty good when you consider, you know, he's competing with people like the Vanderbilts and, you know, these famous families with um, they put huge amounts of money into their, horse racing hobbies and they'd be at the Kentucky Derby every year. I mean, Calumet Farms was just dominated horse racing in the 40s, 50s and some of the 60s. Uh, so Harry was really punching above his weight and he he managed to create this, um, this uh, thoroughbred horse farm, which brought a lot of horses to the Kentucky Derby. He actually won the Kentucky yeah. Derby in one of his five trips there. And uh, that was a very lucrative hobby for him. Um, and the, uh, the other business that he was involved in was, um, the founding of Newsday oh. and, uh, you know, Newsday is the new suburban newspaper on Long Island. His wife, Alicia Patterson was, um, really the brains behind it, uh, in many ways because, um, Harry bought it for her. She comes, you know, Alicia Patterson comes from this famous newspaper publishing family. Her father had founded the daily news in New York. Uh, but she was always been kind of on the outs with the business. Um, mm. Like she was a good writer, but she she never really felt like um, her father ever gave her a real chance in mm. uh, newspapering. So her dream was to run her own newspaper. So Harry essentially bought the paper for her. It was a Newsday at the time. It was a defunct newspaper out in Hempstead, and uh, so Alicia built it into a real powerhouse. Um, but she died in 1963. And at that point, Harry took over the newspaper. Um, it's not that he wasn't involved with it. It's just, he wasn't involved with the editorial side, mm -hmm. but he was running its business operations, basically, um, you know, negotiating with the trade unions and, uh, you know, negotiating prices on print, uh, newspaper print, which was tricky during, during the war years. So, um, so Harry contributed, a lot to Newsday even before Alicia left the scene. And then when Harry came on as publisher of Newsday in 1963, um, he um, made a lot of changes, which kind of continued the forward uh, expansion of the newspaper. But I think the probably the most important thing that he did was to bring on Bill Moyers as publisher of Newsday, because Moyers at the time was LBJ's press secretary. And Bill Moyers was like the most visible person in the Johnson administration. You know, he's holding press conferences every day, but uh, he was um, against the Vietnam War. And, you know, he was having to sort of, you know, represent an administration that was uh, getting more and more and more involved in the mid to late 60s in, in Vietnam, um, committing troops and material and all that. So Moyers... Um, I think was happy to leave the Johnson administration. Uh, he went to work for Harry uh, in late 1966 
and he um, he did a lot of good things at Newsday. He um, he hired uh, additional uh, people of color on staff. I think he hired at least ten or eleven um, uh, people of color to, on the editorial side, and he brought in these people like um, Saul Bellows, the novelist, to come and uh, cover the uh, Arab-Israeli war. Uh, so Moyers did a lot of interesting things, but in the end, he had a, a kind of a bad falling out with Harry. Uh, and Harry decided to sell Newsday about uh, a year before he died. And uh, Moyers, um, uh, Moyers tried to offer his, his own kind of counteroffer to, to take over the newspaper, which Harry didn't accept. Harry didn't really care about the money. He just wanted to sell mm -hmm. the newspaper to a, quote, conservative publisher who would maintain the kind of conservative values that he held. Uh, but even that was um, uh, a mistake because he, um, uh, you know, he thought he was selling the, the paper to Norman Chandler at the LA Times, um, who was a conservative gentleman and um, probably would have run the newspaper with, with kind of more of a conservative bent. But actually at that point, Otis, his son, Otis Chandler, was really running the show. So in some respects, Harry sold his newspaper to a organization that was even more liberal than what Bill Moyers, uh, you know, would have been. Mm -hmm. So um, that was not, uh, uh, I'm not sure it was the greatest decision on his part, but uh, those two businesses, horse racing and newspaper publishing, were businesses that he exited um, shortly before he died. Mm -hmm. And so uh, so those, those don't have the... Um, uh, the legacy that uh, that the other business sectors that he was involved with uh, had. Hmm. This has been pretty interesting, man. This I've yeah. learned a lot, man. I'm learning history. Of course, that's why I love my show, and that's why I love being on it because I get like a front row. <laughs> you guys spend tens of thousands of hours, tens of thousands, yeah, tens of thousands. It's uh -huh. I, I, something's going on with Labor Day today and Monday. Um, tens of thousands of hours researching this stuff, studying it and stuff, and I get like a front row seat to it. I love it. Uh, give us your plugs so people can order the book and uh, get a chance to get that uh, pre-ordered off the uh, fine bookstores there. Well, thanks, Chris. Yeah, it's uh, you can pre-order it on Amazon.com. And uh, to get that link is pretty easy, but you can also uh, get that link off of the uh, Pegasus Books uh, site. So uh, it's got a... Um, uh, 16 pages of photos and it is a it's a pretty breezy read if I do say so um, it's uh, I, I tried not to get too down into the weeds in from one sector to another but I I, uh, I kind of feel like it's a um, it's an interesting business backstory that's never been told because yeah. um, you know I just most people just don't know the name Harry Guggenheim and mm -hmm. they, they might know Lindbergh and they might know Robert Goddard but um, Harry's name is uh, is really worth knowing. And now they will. Now they yeah. will. Yeah. <laughs> so, guys, you can order it up. The Business of Tomorrow, The Visionary Life of Harry Guggenheim, From Aviation and Rocketry to the Creation of an Art Dynasty. Thanks so much, Dirk, for being on the show and spending some time with us. We certainly appreciate it. My pleasure, Chris. Great to be with you. Thanks to my audience and everyone for being here today. Uh, be sure to, of course, uh, subscribe to the show on YouTube. Go to Goodreads. Go to all the different groups that we have over there as well. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other, and we'll see you guys next time.